This is the fourth video on behaviour. In this particular video, we're going to start looking at more complex behaviours than covered in the previous one. Let's assume that students are happy to make inferences on output behaviour based solely on the poles of a transfer function, and that's been covered previously. And we're going to assume that students understand how to estimate, that's the key word is estimate, the speed of response from the pole positions. This video is going to look at more general information within the pole positions and tell us about the expected behaviour. So not just how fast does the system respond, but what sort of response do we have? Is it oscillatory or not oscillatory? Does it converge smoothly or not? So the previous video looked solely at the speed of response for real poles. And now we want to ask ourselves, how does the behaviour change when the poles are complex, and indeed are complex poles a problem or not. For simplicity, this video is going to assume single, it's a keyword, single quadratic factors. It is possible that a process will have multiple quadratic factors, and in that case simple insights are not possible, but I would also argue that such cases are relatively rare and therefore way beyond the remit of what you would want to cover in these videos. Here's an example then of what we want to deal with. Let's assume that a transfer function has the following shape. So g equals some k times s plus b over s plus a all squared plus omega squared. And you'll notice we've deliberately put into the denominator complex roots. You cannot find two real roots for this pole polynomial. Now as a consequence, if you were to do the inverse Laplace, you're going to find it's characterized with solutions a bit like this. There's going to be an e to the minus 80. You can see that because you've got this s plus a squared. And then you'll have a sinusoid. And here, I've been generic. I've said it could have a bit of sine and a bit of cosine. Uh, we're not too worried about uh, whether it's sine or cosine or a mixture of the two. The key thing is it oscillates with frequency omega. Now, the other thing we're going to do is ignore the fact that, in general, g may also have real poles attached to it. So I could uh, multiply the g that you've been given here by a simple real pole. That will just complicate issues which take away from insight and therefore we don't want to deal with them here. Basic observations then. We've given a transfer function. There it is. g equals 3 s plus 1 over s plus 1 squared plus 6 squared. Now what you can see very clearly is the real part of the root is minus 1. And I've marked that over here. And therefore, the solution contains an e to the minus t. Now, e to the minus t is this red line here. It's modulated by 3, because you'll see there was a 3 in the numerator. That's why it starts from 3. So that e to the minus t gives us an envelope for the magnitude of the response. Now, there was also an imaginary part in the root. You can see the 6 squared here, and that tells us that we've got a sine 6t plus something, I'm not worried about the phase, in the solution. So we've got a sinusoid with a frequency of 6, and that you can see with this blue curve. So the resultant curve is the blue curve. You notice it oscillates up and down, but stays within the envelope e to the minus t. Now the question you want to ask yourself is, is this response satisfactory or not. And I think in general you would say it's not really because the oscillation is dominating the K. So my system is going to be bashing up and down quite quickly um, and decaying relatively slowly. So there's the summary. Oscillation is dominating decay. And how could we work that out? Well here we had omega equals 6 and we had A equals 1. So what we've got is omega is far bigger than A. So if the imaginary part of the pole is significantly larger than the real part of the pole, you will probably get a response a bit like this, where the oscillation dominates the K, and you're not happy. What about this example here? Now you'll see there's been a subtle difference. The real part's still minus 1, and that's marked here. But now the frequency of oscillation is 1. And you look at the blue curve in this particular example and you say, well, I can't really see 
much oscillation at all. There is a slight undershoot around t equals two seconds before it comes back. <coughs> but the system is oscillating slowly compared to the rate at which it's decaying to zero. And so you don't really notice the oscillation. And therefore, in this particular case, the oscillation is almost irrelevant. The fact you have complex poles doesn't matter. You're dominated by the real part of the pole. So here we have the conclusion. The decay is dominating the oscillation. And one way we can uh, anticipate that is by looking at the relative magnitude of the imaginary part here, omega, and the real part, a. Here, omega equals a. And in general, if omega is less than or equal to a, you probably won't see much oscillation. The insights then. If you have a simple quadratic factor, if the real part is bigger than the imaginary part, then oscillation has a relatively small effect, and hence the decay is close to the behavior you would expect from simple real poles. Not exactly the same, but fairly close. If the imaginary part is bigger than the real part, then the oscillation will begin to dominate the behavior, and this will be undesirable in general. So here's a graph to illustrate where we might want the poles to be. Now we'll start with the speed of response, which was the previous video. Let's draw a vertical line down here. And you'll see what we've put in the box here. If the real part is too close to the imaginary axis, then you've got slow behavior. And therefore, that is unsatisfactory. So the first test is to make sure that the poles do not lie in this region here that I've hashed as red. Otherwise, it's too slow. Now, I perhaps should have made a clearer statement at the very start. Naturally, this bit I'm hashing in black, we definitely can't have the poles in the right half plane. Otherwise, we're divergent. So we'll take that for granted. So we can't be in the black hash area. That's unstable. We can't be in the red hashed area because that means our responses are too slow. Where you need to determine for your context what that means. So where can our poles be? Well, we've got this region here that I've written good OK. So that means the poles are pretty much on the real axis and they're fast enough. We've also got this region over here where I've put good strack fast. Now, in general, you probably won't end up there because in order to get very fast poles, you often need active inputs. So it's unrealistic. So you probably won't have poles all the way down there if you're happy with the circle. Good. OK. OK. What happens next? You'll see I've also got a box where it just says OK. And here we're in the region, and I'll write this, where A is bigger than omega. So what we're saying, and I'll use this blue hash line, is if you're in this region here, the real part of the pole is bigger than the imaginary part of the pole. So the decay will dominate the oscillation. And therefore, you won't tend to notice the oscillation. And the response will be fine. What about this region up here, which I'm now going to hash with red again, so that red being sort of not desirable. In this particular region, I've got omega bigger than A. So what we're saying is the frequency is faster than the real part of the uh, root. And so you expect the oscillation to dominate the, K, so the, the decay. So the system will oscillate up and down. So likely, if you've got a pole up here, your behavior will be too oscillatory and you won't be very happy. That leaves the region between the blue and the red. And you'll notice I've put debatable and it's shaded in blue. Basically, that means there's going to be a borderline between the region where you're OK and the region where you're not OK. And that borderline will be fairly fuzzy in general. So you won't be able to quantify exactly. It will vary by context. But the key thing is, if your pole's clearly in the blue shaded, you expect to be all right. If it's clearly in the red shaded, you think I probably won't be all right. And if you're somewhere on the border, well, you might be all right. You might not. Some examples then to go through this. Are the pole positions for the following system acceptable or not? And what sort of speed of response will you get? So let's write this out in the standard quadratic form. So you've got s plus 2 all squared plus 
8. And therefore, you've got roots at minus 2 plus or minus j to root 2. And what you'll notice here is that the imaginary part, so you've got omega, is bigger than a. So for this particular example, you would expect the oscillation to dominate the decay, but only just, not by much, just by a little bit. You also can see that the real part is minus 2, so the time constant is going to be a half. OK, so you expect it to settle in approximately two seconds. Now, I think, um, I'm, no, I don't need to rub that out. Let's have a look at the picture then and see what step response we get from this system. Here we go. And it's pretty much what you expected. There's two seconds. You can see it settles pretty much in two seconds, as expected by the real part. There is a bit of an overshoot. You can see that here. But it's not massive. And that's sort of what you would have expected. The imaginary part is a bit bigger than the real part in the roots, um, but not massively. And therefore, the oscillation is small as opposed to significant. So you might decide, oh, it's just about acceptable. But this is in the region of debatable. Is it acceptable or not? What about this one here, then? So I've got 3 of s squared plus 4s plus 6. So I'll do the same analysis again. Let's write it in the standard form. s plus 2 all squared plus 2. And so in this particular um, solution, we've got roots at minus 2 plus or minus j root 2. So in this case, you'll see the real part dominates the imaginary part. The time constant's the same as before, so we expect it to settle in about two seconds. But we also expect to see very little evidence of oscillation because the real part dominates the imaginary part. And here's the step response. And what do you notice? You can't really see much oscillation at all. Now, if you look very, very carefully, you'll see there's a very small overshoot just there. It goes just past the steady state before coming back. But it's pretty much insignificant, and therefore we can almost get away with saying this is pretty close to just having real roots at minus 2. Again, you'll see the settling time around 2 seconds, pretty much what you expected. Now, a slightly more complex example, just to finish off. And this one, we've given you the plot straight away, and you look at that plot and you say it looks just like a first order response. And yet, You've given me a cubic. So let's see if we can unpack this. Why does it look like a first order response when we've got a cubic? So where are the roots? Let's start with a quadratic bit. The quadratic bit gives me s plus 2 squared plus 11, which gives me roots at minus 2 plus or minus j root 11. And you're looking at that and you're saying, yikes, the imaginary bit is beginning to get quite large. I really do expect the oscillation to be dominating the decay here and to see quite a lot of oscillating up and down. However, the corresponding time constant for this is 0.5 seconds. And so the settling time is approximately 2 seconds. Now, let's look at our graph and ask ourselves, where is 2 seconds? So I'm going to draw 2 seconds on. It's about here. So what do you notice? Yes, that, uh, for that particular mode, the oscillation may dominate the decay. But to be honest, it's been and gone very, very quickly, which is why I can't see anything. If we look at the other pole, there it is, s plus 0.1, we notice for the other pole, the time constant is 10. It's much, much slower. And that explains why the settling time is around 40 seconds four times the time constant. So in this particular case, we've got a very slow mode, which is a real pole, and we've got some very fast modes, which are the oscillatory poles. And in this particular case, the fast modes have not been observed because they've disappeared very quickly. In summary then, many systems include quadratic factors in the poles, and what we want is a simple insight into the nature of the poles and the associated behaviours. The time constant 
can be determined from the real part, and that's relatively straightforward. We get the real part, we work out the time constant, roughly four times the time constant gives us the settling time for the associated mode. Now, whether the oscillation is tolerable can be estimated, and we must emphasize that it's estimated, it's not exact, from whether the imaginary part is bigger or smaller than the real part. But this is a fairly crude estimate. It's not going to be exact by any means. However, where a system has lots more poles, it's not always clear what the dominant modes will be. And so you could have a quadratic factor with what appear to be relatively nasty modes, but if those modes are not dominant, they may not be observed in the output at all, because they may be insignificant.